Well, again, welcome if you've just joined us and thanks very much for joining Space Store Healthcare this afternoon. My name's Alex Harvey and I'm VP of Sales Globally with Space Store. And wanted to um, introduce this, um, the panelists and our conversation topic today. So welcome if you've joined us on the Teams webinar platform and also welcome for those of us who joined on the LinkedIn live stream. And as we go through today, would really like to encourage you to interact to join the conversation through the Q&A box on Teams or through the, the normal chat box that you'll see on the LinkedIn live stream if you join through LinkedIn. So um, without further ado, we'd like to introduce the, the topic and our panellists to you. So as I mentioned, my name is Alex Harvey. Uh, my role really is to facilitate this conversation along with my colleague Shane. My, my background and my role within Space Store has been very much working with our clients on a global basis and we'll touch a bit about who Space Store are in a second, but working with our clients in designing and creating the, the environments and the particularly the workplace environments or the um, healthcare environments that enable them to be as productive as they can be. Now, the background to Space Store is that we are the creators of furniture that's a blend of California Cool and London Design. Our background and our heritage is very much in the workplace furniture environment. So creating workplace furniture for many of our clients here and across Europe, here in the UK, I should say, and across Europe, and also across the US and globally. So working with tech firms such as Google and Facebook or clients in the financial um, services sector, in the consultancy sector. And then more recently during 2020, we started hearing from um, different NHS trusts saying some of the products that you're producing and you're designing with your workplace sector clients would work really well to help us address a particular challenge we're having, which was around um, virtual consulting, video consulting and creating acoustically enhanced private environments for individual um, video consultations to happen. So that's a bit of the background to, to why we're here today and the conversation. But as I say, I'm super excited to be introducing our panelists. So without further ado, perhaps we could introduce Professor Tara Rampel first. Um, Tara, do you want to give yourself a bit of an introduction and some context to your background and experience to our audience? Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very delighted to be here, especially with Rachel, you and Shane to discuss digital inclusivity. So. I am a consultant anesthetist, and I also run a telehealth initiative in the southeast of England, which is for optimization of patients, remote telehealth optimization of patients who have been diagnosed with cancer. I, my academic interests include very much uh, the course that I'm passionate about, which is making sure everyone has equity of access to all healthcare innovations, um, which brings us very naturally to this conversation we're going to be having. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks, Tara. Thanks for joining us and excited to hear your, your viewpoints and also your experiences, because I think as we were discussing yesterday, the experiences and challenges and maybe the things that we've tried that didn't work, that's really where this conversation comes to life. Um, Rachel, perhaps you could introduce yourself as well. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to join this uh, panel as well. It's a really interesting topic. So I'm Rachel Binks. I'm the nurse consultant for digital and acute care at Airedale NHS Foundation Trust up in Yorkshire. Um, and I'm the clinical lead in our telemedicine hub where we deliver a number of telemedicine services to, to a number of different um, cohorts of patients. We have Imedicare, which is our care home service, so 24-7 support for any member of staff in a care home who's worried about a resident. Um, they call through to us and we, we support them to keep that resident at home if we possibly can. 90% uh, of our calls end up with the resident remaining where they are. Um, and if we do need to refer on or get them into hospital, then we all do all that for them as well. So we can really support um, often non-registered practitioners, but also registered practitioners in the care home environment to keep people safe in the home or get them where they need to be. Um, we also have a 24-7 service called Goldline, which is for people in their last year of life. So anybody who's on the gold standards framework in our area, which is Bradford Districts and Craven, get 24-7 access to our clinical team. So then the, the patients themselves and their loved ones can call us whenever they've got a worry or something they need to um, ask a question about or if they need to be referred on for symptom control, pain management, that sort of thing. Um, we obviously were very... Um, 
through COVID very active with the COVID virtual wars and COVID oximetry at home services, which thankfully have now um, gone down to almost nothing, which is brilliant. Um, but we've also set up a service called Micro 24, which is 24 seven service for people in their own homes. So we've got a gold line for people in the last year of life, Micro 24 for those who are not in the last year of life. And we've got a cohort of 6,000 people in their own homes with COPD who we're supporting at the moment and getting uh, that service live for them to keep them safe and healthy and happy at home. So in terms of, um, inclusivity obviously we need to in our area make sure that everybody has access to these services our care home services across the country um so we're very lucky we, really we have a very sort of wide culturally diverse team of staff here um who speak a number of different languages and we also have other ways in which we ensure that people have access um to the digital technology that we offer and it's lovely to be here very good thanks rachel very um a real breadth of experience there that i'm sure we can tap into and, and hear some useful insights from you as we go through today's conversation. And Shane, perhaps you can introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks Alex. Yeah, also good to be here with Rachel and Tara. Great to hear your insights. And so I'm Shane, I'm a concept advisor at Space Store Healthcare and focus on serving our NHS clients and working out solutions with our, main with our modular acoustic pods. Thank you. Very good. And, and that really brings us to the to the main subject of today, which, as you can see, the webinar title inclusivity for everyone addressing digital inequalities within communities. And what I'd be interested to do is maybe just um, amongst the, the four of us just bat around. What do we mean when we say digital inequality? Because I'm sure that there could be many different ang angles and aspects and interpretations of what that actually means and maybe i'll kick off with with one of the experiences that we've had over the last few years which is working one of our luck with uh, with one of our large clients in the in the tech sector so um, google who are designing workspaces for their own people and one of the things that they very much engaged with space store on is the creation of a a video pod which they wanted to be inclusive and accessible for everyone so in the the particular project we all projects we were working with them on that meant looking at how can that video experience be optimized for the user um, no matter what their skin color or skin tone is so that everyone has you know equitable digital experience everyone is equally represented and i think what they were recognizing and what we're all starting to recognize is that you know in the old days pre-2020 we, we used to be in a room together when we had a meeting that's often not the case we're now on a video call so how can we make sure that we're not losing you know, people's participation, people's um, feedback and, and contribution to that meeting where we don't have the body language and the visual cues that we might might used to have had. So that was one part of it. Another part of it was very much focused around accessibility. So, for example, for wheelchair users, for, for users who may have a specific ambulant requirement, um, how can we make these environments accessible for everybody? Um, and then I was just doing a, a quick bit of Googling before the conversation and said, you know, what does digital inclusivity mean? Um, and there's many, many different examples and different interpretations of, of that. And I think it might be easy for us to maybe assume this affects a particular group or particular community, but I think it actually could well be a lot wider than we first think. But glad of your, your thoughts on that, Rachel, and, and how you're seeing you know, which community groups do you see be being particularly impacted by the availability of digital access? It, it is interesting, isn't it? The as you say, the definition of this because is it about access to the technology and access to things like smartphones and the apps that we use? Is it about access to um, understanding about how these things work? Is it about having somebody there that supports them to use these pieces of equipment? Um, is it about having other versions, paper versions? You know, if people don't want to use the tech, do they have to use the tech? Um, and language of course really important you know if people can't understand or speak english very well then then that might be difficult which is why we're so happy that we've got this this culture diverse team here um but not only that people who are homeless you know people who who don't, don't have anywhere to to get their wi-fi from all the you know the, the equipment that they need so i think there's a huge broad array of digital inequality across the country and, and that is something that we do need to address and the kind of things that we do we have our care home service for instance is a fully managed service so we have relationship managers that go into the care homes to make sure that the staff there know how to use the kit and it is usually a laptop or you know a device tablet like that with the software on it so we make sure that it's very easy and that literally all they have to do is click on a button 
and we make sure all the tech's in place, the Wi-Fi is strong enough, all that sort of thing. Um, but then for other services, for people in their own homes, you know, not everybody does have a smartphone or an iPad or something like that. My, my mum has one um, and she refused to use it when she got COVID. She didn't want the app. She wanted paper. <laughs> you know, she's 84 and she's quite happy to use her iPad for her news and her watching television, all that sort of thing. But she didn't want to use it for her, her health care, for her, her oximetry um, reading. She didn't want to put them into an app. She couldn't be bothered with downloading the app because she doesn't really understand all that. So, so much, isn't there? There's so much that can be... Um, a problem for people and I suppose for us it's about getting through those issues and working out exactly what the problem is and we've certainly been doing some work with a company called Thrive by Design in our area to make sure that we understand those needs and those requirements so that we can really properly address them. Yeah very interesting yeah, go ahead Tara you've probably got some thoughts on this as well. Um, I am going to support what Rachel has said it's very interesting because NHS England, uh, NHS long term plan when it was issued in 2019, there was a commitment in there to make a more concentrated and system wide systematic approach to reduce health inequalities and unwanted variation in care. And the way we are developing digital services, telehealth, telemedicine services, we need to be very mindful that access to digital health does not become yet another social determinant, a wider determinant of health inequality. Rachel has very nicely highlighted in her experience what a few barriers of inclusivity are. And I think it's always, I mean, technology is a tool. It's nothing new. It has always existed. And there has, the barrier has to be the barrier of the staff engagement with the technology that is offering and the barrier of the user. And that's the way to look at it. And I always, this is my anesthetic hat on because we always like to classify things. Looking at the user and the patient at the interface, is it access? Are they connected to the internet? Like the homeless pe uh, people that you mentioned, but also people in far flung rural areas as well. Internet connectivity, uh, high bandwidth connections are a problem. Are they, if they are connected, do they have the right skill set? Not everyone has the ability to use the internet and online services to manage healthcare conditions. And the self-efficacy, which and confidence and this trust is a uh, trust issues are a crucial one because I may be able to log into an app, I may be able to access and use it, but do I trust that there will not be a misdiagnosis? There is not going to be a data breach, privacy breach of uh Will it decrease the interaction and the personal relationship that we have with our consultants? So these are very valid concerns. And then is motivated motivation because people are sometimes just not motivated enough to use digital technologies. Yes, it's available. Yes, I can access it, but I don't want to access them just right now. And that is the most challenging barrier to break through the motivation I find. And it's similarly coming to the staff side, we have sometimes often outdated legacy systems and it's just organizations are uh, you know sometimes the systems are clunky they're fragmented one uh, telehealth system may not be able to speak with the any, anyone and i'm really hoping with development of integrated care systems these barriers will start getting challenged and we'll be able to have robust and safe infrastructure for data sharing and able to speak with each other but also in our planning we need to realize from the National Health Service, from the healthcare provider side, that the ultimate goal is not deployment of technology. The ultimate goal is not that we deliver on the plan that we have digitalized and brought about a revolution. The ultimate goal is patient benefit and technological advances. Digital healthcare should complement what is already existing and try and replace where it is more efficient and safe to do that. And deliver on patient benefits, real tangible benefits, as opposed to just the plan that we have carved out. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Tyra, and it's fascinating, isn't it? You talked about the NHS PAM from 2019, which of course was pre-pandemic, pre-COVID. We had terrible issues for the 10 years before that. And I have to be honest, particularly with doctors and, and GPs and people in, in primary care about, you know, video was never gonna, it's never gonna be any good. It's, people won't want their, their healthcare in that way. And in a way, and it's the only thing we can say, thank goodness to COVID, apart from the fact the roads were very uh, much quieter, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it, the, the one thing is such a, good, a benefit of COVID is that people started to use technology for things like healthcare and realised that actually it works really well in terms of sustainability. You know, the, the amount of travel we don't need to do now and we can have meetings like this that people are just 
accept accept as, as normal day to day work. We struggled for years to have something like this that people accepted as being a you know a multidisciplinary team meeting, for instance, with a patient in a care, a resident in a care home and their carer, plus a GP, plus a GP in the hospital or a doctor in the hospital and, or their discharge team or something like that. You know, and now, thank goodness, it's becoming commonplace. So there's so much we can use digital technology for that people just didn't really accept pre-COVID that we could. Um, but you're absolutely right, you know, there will always be some people that don't want to do that, which is why we were talking about the paper versions of things um, and the fact that we always use people. So, for instance, with our MyCare service, we've got an implementation manager who's absolutely brilliant. We've got um, Band 3 staff and, and band the, the clinical uh, nurses, band six and seven, to take the calls, the clinical calls, and it can be escalated to them. But we have the people that talk, you know, so anybody we onboard, we talk to them first, we have a conversation with them on the telephone or via video if they've got that um, technology available and, and introduce them to the service in that way. We don't just send them out an app and say, this is, you know, download it. We're going to start using you this to support you, your healthcare, your COPD. And I think that's crucial. We won't get people to engage. Uh, if we don't do things like that, not, not enough people. And the same with the relationship management team that we have within the in Medicare care home service. You know, without that relationship management team going in either virtually or in person to the care homes and building up a relationship with those staff, it would never work as well as it does. People wouldn't use the service. Um, so, yeah, absolutely crucial that we don't forget people <laughs> are still needed in this, but you might not need so many. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, we knew pre-pandemic, you know, the outpatient attendance uh, via telephone or telemedicine was 4% in February, and it rose to 35% in April, and, you know, 68% of people when they were, when the ONS surveyed in August 2020 said they'll be very comfortable uh, advancing. And this also has put a new highlight, it started highlighting where the gaps are, because the data, which is pre-pandemic, which highlights the issue, and this is often stereotyped, the age discrepancies that people older than 65 years of age uh, will not be as au fait and confident accessing digital health, that the pandemic, you know, the 78-year-old grandfathers and grandmothers have had to install Zoom and Skype and WhatsApp video calling to speak with their extended family. So they have become very com comfortable, very confident in using those tools. And we need to be a little bit careful on what we mean by digital health and telehealth and telemedicine. And these are very interchangeable terms. Um, our colleagues across the pond, when they were surveyed, the American Medical Associated, Association highlighted that when they say telemedicine, 69% of the telemedicine input was still audio calls. You know, sometimes if there is a patient who's got chronic disease, they don't necessarily often need a brand new digital platform to be able to manage that disease. What we found in our service when we run the cancer prehab service, we do the initial screening of the patient, then prescribe their nutritional plans, their prescribed exercise based on a certain frequency, intensity, type, and duration, and then psychological support. And sometimes after the initial conversation on our digital platform for the mental health and emotional support, often the people just prefer having a phone call, a check-in phone call every week to make sure that everything is okay. So uh, it take, it's multifaceted, it's complex, and Sometimes it is, it's almost narrows down the scope that is available if we start thinking of it in terms of just the apps that we have and that what we offer. People and the relationships and trust are the key. And this will be, you know, I often wonder what is the barrier? Why are we not breaking through? For example, our service in Kent, um, only 5% of people who are referred to our service are from minority ethnic background. So why is that? We don't get, and then, I often think with digital services, and I'm sure, Rachel, you've had this experience as well, uh, awareness is a huge problem. When you have developed a digital offering, we know that there is online prescriptions and online GP appointments available, but yet there is a waiting list because sometimes people are not available that they can get prescriptions done and repeat prescriptions online. So awareness and education and equally on the other side, if you go for very, we are all champions of our service and we know our services inside out. But if you go in a big organization, we are not always the ones who are meeting the patient. And the staff needs to be aware as well where they can signpost the patients with confidence. Where can they go? So, you know, going back to the Blair years, education, education, education. I think this goes to providers, uh, 
to healthcare professionals and to patients. All of them need awareness and education building exercises. Yeah, there's, there's some great points there and I'm really enjoying what you're both saying. The the points you made, um, Tara, around the the different aspects, you know, whether people have access, whether people have the right skills, whether they've got the confidence, uh, what we've talked about, awareness, whether they have the motivation, as Rachel was saying, I, I think these are really interesting different barriers but I, I i really liked what you said rachel but coming back to uh, what's this all for and it's really about the patient and i think as you say trying to prescribe you know this particular path is is the way to access services i i, I love what we said about you know it's this is about patient choice and ultimately it's about the patient getting the help and and the support that they need it is absolutely and i think it's it's also important to you know at the moment default seems to be everybody i work within an acute trust everybody coming to a and e is the default we don't want that we want people to be cared for at home and cared for very well at home you know knowing that it's very safe and they're getting what they need and we're taking care to them not them not having to come out for it and i think when people start to understand that then you can become far more inclusive because most people don't want to come and sit in an a and e department for hours and hours um, and I think, you know, things like the ambulance services and, you know, could be doing this far more, actually, because if we have a telephone call to 999, but we can't see the patient, we have no idea really. And so they, we've tried to work with ambulance services for many years to do things like that. Um, it is difficult. And part of the difficulty is in a rural area, as uh, Tara was saying, you know, poor Wi-Fi, poor 4G con connectivity, that sort of thing. But there is still so much more we can do to make things so much more efficient um, and we need to have pathways in place that allow us to be able to refer to other um, uh, teams you know so that we don't have everybody going 999 to a and e we, we've got a lot of people out there who, who can go to perhaps not gp services at the moment because they're overwhelmed but you know to, to primary care services or to other areas or to social support and that sort of thing and i think it's about that coordination of the care to make sure that yes it's great to use tech and it's great to make sure we know exactly what's wrong with that person but we need to know where to refer them on to and where they need to go to for help and that's part of what we do with all our services we act as a coordination center as well really so it's not just about the tech or the clinical team it's about making decisions for that patient that person when they call at that time you know working out what's wrong with them and making sure we give them what they need I think with the evolution of personalized medicine within the integrated care systems, uh, digital medicine will really come to the fore because at the end of the day, we'll have to start seeing there are some uh, chronic conditions, medical conditions or care needs which lend themselves naturally uh, more flexibly to adoption of digital technologies. Because if you look at it, what we're trying to aim, if we really simplify it, is collect physiological data from the patient and then almost and bring it back to the clinician and then look at the interface first and foremost like you say does this patient need to come into the ed uh, is there a serious threat of this patient if not can this be managed safely and if it can be managed safely then what how often does it need to be monitored and if it is being monitored can we do that virtually so i see in the way it is progressing is definitely now we have trials happening with diabetes we have cancer prehabilitation trials in our services so I see the role of the digital technology really expanding one and is in primary care and, and you know networks where it will be expanding. And the second is management of chronic conditions. I think that is where and we need to ensure that there is, you know, we address then at that point, we take everyone with us in the management of chronic conditions, be it cancer, be it diabetes, be it COPD, like you're running the services as well. And and for these areas, more than anything else, let them be the exemplar, the vanguard that everyone else can follow on from. We need to ensure that we follow the principles of precision management to a certain degree, user engagement. When we say that people are not using technology, were the staff and the users engaged in development of this technology is hugely crucial. Because if we centralize the creation of technology, and then we want to deliver it at local level, that will not happen. No matter where you are, no matter what technology you offer. For us, when we found out uh, the participation of our, uh, the patient participation ethnicity, we went out and conducted uh, patient engagement events with representatives of uh, ethnic minority backgrounds to find out 
what is the challenge in there? You know, is it a trust issue? Is it a language issue? So you need to involve, you know, with us, the platform we've created, we take it back to our patient peer support groups and say, is this what you need? And so, you know, and there's, and your service is doing exactly the same. So user engagement and uh, almost decentralization because the local needs of every population are very different. So you might have a, a population which might have um, an elderly population where frailty management and polypharmacy management is the need of the hour. Designing technology enabled care for that population might be very different from a big city where there is young population, which is, um, you know, the, where their healthcare needs are very different. And similarly on socioeconomic spectrum, you know, some places do require digital health uh, improvements when it comes to smoking cessation, alcohol moderation, recreational drug use. These are the crucial points. Whereas other places, it's more about social engagement events, social isolation, loneliness. So centralization of all the digital initiatives, I don't think is the way forward. A lot of local groups, yes, there is central guidance and framework and governance structure, which we all abide by, but then it has to meet the needs of local population where we are trying to so i'm a huge fan of cloud-based solutions which can be vendor neutral can be plugged in the data can be accessible um and i'm hoping that national health service organizations will start moving towards cloud adoption strategies as well yeah, and it's interesting what you say, Tara. When, when we set up our goal line in 2013, it was based on what patients and loved ones and their families wanted. We had we co-produced it with the the people out there to whom we were going to be offering the service. And and what you were saying about um you know get, get delivering digital digital clinical care, you need. I think one of the things that was a barrier for perhaps the, the medical fraternity pre-COVID to to telemedicine and those kind of services. And I'm, I mean virtual consultations and things. Was that they didn't feel necessary they were very robust and of course now we have things i've got in my hand here this is something that we've been trialing in our area which is actually a stethoscope remote stethoscope and if you've got it on somebody in their own home or in a care home you can actually hear it um in our hub we can actually have, we've got a, you know and it's things like that that make yeah that, and you can do the otoscope there as well alex that you can click on as well if you want to look in people's ears you know ear nose and throat so it's it, amazing pieces of kit like this that are available now um that allow us to really innovate and develop our digital services our technical services so that we can do far more safely with people who who you know, want to be engaged and want to use it, but it takes a, lo a long time. It takes an awful lot of engagement, as you were saying, and chatting to people about what um, things are available and the kind of things that we we can trial. Um, so, yeah, I think it is. It's absolutely fascinating all the things that are out there. It's just making people understand and believe that these things are going to work and they're going to be as good uh, and sometimes perhaps better because it's about efficiencies as well, isn't it? Doing things, lots of things like we've got the 6,000 people we're trying to bring onto our COPD cohort. We could never have kept an eye on 6,000 people without digital technology. Not no, safely we, before. No, we agree. We serve a population of 1.2 million people, 10,000 new cases of cancer getting diagnosed annually. And it's a similar... Uh, and I think what you're highlighting, what we're both trying to say is that a fusion of different systems and services will create a very holistic and patient-centered approach. And this has to be fine-tuned by dynamic real-time engagement and data and engagement both for the confidence of the healthcare professionals engaged from this side and making sure there is engagement from the patient sides and getting them involved in creation. What I used to find uh, amazing sometimes on certain organizations and innovation uh, places I went was it was almost as if there was a solution which was created by the industry that was presented to us to find a place for it an application for it to be used thankfully I think post pandemic I mean uh, we as doctors are not the most advanced when it comes to adoption of technologies I accept that <laughs> I put my hands up you often laggards but we have increased our agility when it comes to adoption of technologies and what we have also started is to create solutions for pre-existing problems with engagement of the users rather than creating and packaging you know the solution and then presenting and trying to find an application of where would this go so finally tuned systems and I think a lot yeah. of information has to be agility and fluidity will be very much more inclusive going ahead. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's change that your colleagues aren't very good at, Tara, rather than <laughs> digital stuff. I think sometimes it just takes yep. a little while for people to accept that change is good, actually, and transformation is, is fantastic. <laughs>
Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm just looking about... in. Sorry, go on, Rachel. Sorry, Alex. I was just I was just looking in the chat box. David's put in a comment here about telling there to not be new. You're absolutely right, David. You've got 1960s. Actually, I've got a slide set that I used to show sort of five, ten years ago, where there was somebody I think in 1850 or something doing something with radio waves, or you know, that was very much around telemetry and 100 and 200 years ago, 150 years ago. Um, an awful lot of time before that. The NHS app that you mentioned here. Um, what can I say? The NHS app to me is not tech as such. The NHS app is just a different way of uh, holding some information as to put a bit of data in into. We don't really get much feedback off it or anything, do we? We just we put stuff into it and, and maybe get something back. I think things like the Zoe app and things like that you know, are, are much more technologically uh, advanced than than perhaps what we had with the NHS, NHS app. And you've put something else there. Sorry, example of prime technology support. Yeah, national, there are quite a lot of national funding streams out there, um, but as usual, you have there's an awful lot of bureaucracy and paperwork to fill in if you want to get that funding. And often you have to prove that you've got a service up and running before they'll give you the money to start the service, which doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, I perhaps ought to not say much, much more on that. Politically sensitive, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm yeah. keeping an eye on chats because I'm hoping Shane or Alex will tell me what's happening. So, yeah, Especially absolutely. We'll get we'll gather the questions as they as they're coming through. Um, but no, I, was, I was interested in what, what we were saying as to flexibility and agility, because I think that's probably something in the last two years has has really taken a surge, you know, everywhere within the NHS, but but I think within every imaginable sector of life. Um, and, and also, I, I'm wondering whether there's maybe some initiatives around bringing industry and the healthcare professionals closer together so that there isn't this kind of isolated development of technology and then presenting, you know, here's a package solution. Now, see if you can find out a way to use it. <laughs> yeah. I think you're right, Alex. My frustration is that none of them talk to each other. You know, so if industry could get together and actually things could talk to each other, because we we can't use five different platforms for five different bits of tech. You know, the poor nurses here have got an awful lot to do with keeping an eye and checking up on on people's um, healthcare records and making sure that we're up to date with everything and all the letters and everything that are added to the healthcare records in in System One, which is what we use, or or Emis. Let alone having to log into ten different platforms for for little bits of tech that really ought to all be talking to each other. Um, I think, yeah, while I agree with you wholeheartedly, I think there will be often a variability and a platform for clinical application that will always be happening there. And I think it's just and, uh, and a way so that this, the information, it's very fluid and cohesive and almost all the cogs fit into each other. And that is the conversation. It is happening. I haven't been to an innovation conference now where a pre-packaged solution has been presented to me now. So it's often... What is happening currently, though, I think, is that there is, as always, Rachel, it happens in uh, under the giant umbrella of Department of Health and Social Care, is that there is a, a select group that is always having conversations and developing. And sometimes there's a huge gap within the select group that is advising, legislating, and doing the administrative work and steering of the medical technology where it should go to the cold face clinicians. There is a huge gap. So, for example, I sometimes get presented with a very fancy app and I some uh, you know saying will your patients like to try this and I have to say some of my patients only want a phone call that's all they can that's all the telehealth they, and that's all they need rather than me almost push that's all they need a check-in conversation so I think uh, we need to somehow address also this gap while we're talking about inclusivity and bringing together everyone of every age, every ethnicity, and what we're forgetting also is that, uh, and this data is old, it was in 2018, if I correctly think, ONS had published, uh, people with disabilities, you know, the access, especially to internet on go, a lot of us pick up our phone and look at the internet on go. So we need to start designing platforms that allow, even though the gap has now decreased between access to internet on go and consequently to medical technology between people who have registered themselves as having disabilities and those which haven't, when we are trying to bring all these barriers in while we are creating pathways, we also need to decrease that gap and, you know, kind of almost uh, between the cabinet and the local MP, you know, we need to start designing services for our local population. We need the cold face clinicians, the healthcare professionals who are out there. You know, if your population has got a very high need uh, for, for example, technological need for mental health uh, interventions, the best people will be community nurses and paramedics who are out there on the street. They understand what's going on and they will tell us, well, you know, we need this to support this to support its self-management. That's what we're trying to do with digital health. We're not replacing an experienced nurse. We're not um, replacing a doctor. We're trying to give empower people 
to manage their own conditions. And in doing so, making sure no one gets left behind. So involving them in the design and involving the people who look after them in the design, rather than having directives from our umbrella organizations as to how and what solutions we must be presenting. I will also go quiet. Yeah. This is politically uh, controversial. Yeah. Well, no, I, I agree with you, but I do think it's not just about people and self-help. I mean, as I said, our telemedicine service for the care homes in Medicare is 24-7 reactive. Yeah. So if they've got an acute issue, but they need, we need a clinician at the other end of the video, you know, to, to make that, to do that um, assessment, that triage, which is why a kit like the remote um, stethoscope would, would be useful. So I think it's a mixture, you know, it really is a mixture of both. And this is going back to inequalities and, and um inclusion inclusion we need to make sure we have interpreting services available you know 24 7 we need to make sure that we can absolutely get a really uh, robust assessment done whether it's using technology or whether it's getting somebody into that person's home or care home to do a face-to-face -face if that's what's needed you know we need to make sure we get people out quickly if they do need to come into hospital but we don't bring them out when they don't so one of my big issues and again it's probably a bit controversial is around when people fall in care homes for instance and some of the nice the nice guidance is suggesting that anybody who falls and it's on witness has to come to a &E and have a ct scan if they bump the head what a load of rubbish you know most of those people if they're 98 with advanced dementia there's no way we're going to do neurosurgery on them so why on earth would you want to bring somebody out of their care home where they're comfortable and safe into a hospital to sit on a trolley where they may die on a trolley well they're better off dying in their own bed you know and and we have to sort of being brave about those kind of um decisions and, and things and we can't do that without tech because otherwise if we didn't have the tech in place, all those people would be put into an ambulance and brought into hospital. Whereas actually we can very safely make very sensible decisions if we have good pathways in place working with technology um, to make sure that we, we start to be, as I say, a bit braver and a bit more sensible about some of the decisions that we're making, I think. Honesty. I think honesty about what we can offer, uh, whether it's digitally and honesty about the risks of digital medicine and telemedicine as well. That will go a long way in bringing together people who feel that lack of trust, honesty, and I think incremental delivery, and let's not just overload slowly. Our funding, our governance, our procurement structures need to be robust enough to allow incremental delivery and an attainment of target or occasionally deviation from the path we had set down for based on what the demand of our local population is, definitely. Absolutely. And if we had some of those processes in place for people in the last sort of six weeks where we've had ambulances, you know, 12 hour waits and all that sort of thing, which is is heartbreaking and, and all the things that have been happening. And I feel for the, the ambulance teams and the people that are waiting for them. But, you know, if we'd have had different technology in, or different services in place to to filter out those that didn't need the ambulance, for instance, or didn't need to go to hospital that quickly, then actually some of those waits wouldn't have happened because we would have become far more efficient and far more cost effective, actually, by making it by using technology to make sure that we can we only bring people into hospital when they really need to come. Cost for us as well as uh, opportunity cost for our patients. Absolutely. The travel expense, the arranging the sandwich generation has to look after their parents as well as their children, arranging child care and carer responsibilities, taking a day off work. Um, yeah, it's the opportunity cost is huge. I thought you wanted to speak, Alex, so I'll go quiet. Yeah, I, I was just going to say we're coming to our last five minutes, so it's been it's been a very fascinating conversation. One thing I was wondering, just as you were both speaking there, do, do you ever see a mismatch between maybe the pathway that the patient would choose and the clinical requirement for that condition? I was thinking of some of the mental health trusts we've talked to where they actually need to see the patient maybe every three visits, whether that's video or physically, and whilst the patient preference may be to, towards a phone conversation, for example, actually physically having eyes on is also very, very important. And kind of how do we manage that so that we're, we're giving the patient what they want or need, but also yeah. the physicians what they need? Sorry, Rachel. I think some, sometimes you're right. I, you know, I'm going to say sometimes I think you're right. And I've had conversations years ago with mental health colleagues about this, and they were very clear that in A&E, for instance, they needed to have hands on and be there and see that that patient, how they were behaving and their, their non-verbals and all that sort of stuff. Well, actually, with a good high definition camera, you can see all that anyway, you know, as long as it's positioned properly and we're using tech in the right way. Um, so I don't think that that that's necessarily always a barrier, but you're absolutely right. And right at the beginning, I think we said this. It's not about getting rid of people. It's about making sure that people are being used when they need to be used. And if we don't need to use people because we can do things very safely using technology, then we do that to make things much more efficient and cost effective. So I think there's a huge conversation that we need to have about, as I mentioned earlier, being brave and actually what do we need people for having those face to face or, you know, clinical people having that conversation and what can we use perhaps less, less, um, 
you know, not non-registered practitioners for because some of them are absolutely brilliant. Um, and what we actually need doctors for, and what we need nurses for, and what we need specialist practitioners for. It, they're the huge conversation to have, and and yeah, it it needs to happen really. So I am not a mental health care uh, practitioner, so I don't have experience there, but I have an experience of delivering the prehab service in which psychological support plays a huge role. And as we prepare patients for their cancer treatment, support them through their rehabilitation surgery. And what I have realized is when we have conversations, when the physiologists and prehab instructors have conversations, often the quest, first question asked to us is for the psychological support element will i have to come into the hospital and if we say no the patients are often relieved because they say that they're bombarded with scans and chemo appointments and radiology and if it is yet another appointment considering prehab is not mandatory they may opt out of it um, and that often leads me to reflect as to why is that when you come to patients and obviously there are always be patients who need to come into the ED, they will need to come into the hospital. But in this group that I'm looking into, there is a huge unnoticed and often not mentioned thing about vulnerability, which is, you know, almost the gap between where the people feel more safe and secure and the kind of stress placed on them upon their surroundings. So you design like your furniture design and bringing that as a corollary here. Where do you feel the most safe? Where is your fav your my favorite red sofa right behind me where I go down at the end of a busy day and think I can relax here and I can have honest chats, whether it's with my children, whether it's with my husband. It's the same with people. Where do they feel best discussing their anxieties, their vulnerabilities, their fears and conversations? It's in the safety and security of their home. Um, so I think uh, what you say about mismatch, sometimes we tell them that, you know, we will be happy. It's same with exercise to a certain degree. When you do, when you're monitoring patients, when you're giving them exercise to get fit for an operation or rehabilitation post-operation, they can perform this under, like Rachel has highlighted, first trained and then under, you know, high equity cameras, digital platforms. They can have their adherence, their compliance. So, I think clinical application for every medical condition is different, but within that medical treatment, you will have to come in for your chemotherapy, but for your prehabilitation, you don't need to come in. You can do that. And that allows us to access those patients that we wouldn't have access, those who are living in a far flung village and not necessarily in a nice town of Seven Oaks that has got, you know, tra uh, wonderful train connections. So there is a mismatch. and. We are starting, it's almost, I'm most encouraged that the conversation is now being started by, pe by patients. They are starting to ask, is it possible to have this done through a telephone or a video calling mechanism or will I have to come in? So it's very encouraging. And I see that, you know, like your, somebody just pointed out, technology is not new, no. But embracing of technology, both by healthcare practitioners and by patients, has been less than straightforward road, hasn't it? So many, you know, but nothing worth having comes without a price. So we will keep on championing the cause of telehealth and making it for everyone easy to access. Very good. I've just got a question on the um, LinkedIn platform. So from Rosbear, who's asking Professor Remple, um, his comment is that one thing that strikes me is a disconnect between the ambitions, targets and plans and how these translate into concrete measures that can deliver impact on the ground. So I'd be interested in your, your comments around that. I think uh, facts on ground come hugely from awareness of what's available for the population. So there is, if I design a wonderful platform for patients coming, coming in to have proton beam radiotherapy and then just keep it as a select knowledge between myself and two other oncologists and design it with a tech expert, that is not going to re release the potential of the we, what we put into that platform. The facts on ground are created when there is engagement, user engagement, which has happened, and there is awareness and education by default when people are talking to these patients about the proton beam radiotherapy that they might be having they also mention and do you also know that you're possible you can optimize yourself to receive that through this platform so education and awareness and also uh, you know we were discussing about uh, 
making it a very adaptable platform that can respond to the needs of the patients. And so if you've trialed something for six months, collect the feedback for it to be a fact on ground for the, from the user group. We are very hesitant to do user surveys within the health and you know, social care sector. We, we initially have lots of patient collaborations and consultations. Then we go and roll out and then we start delivering on the plan and not real patient benefits. But as the pandemic has shown, it takes the blink of an eye for the clinical picture and everything to change. So for it, it has to be a live ongoing conversations to create facts on ground of any healthcare innovation that we've done. We'll start looking at it as value as opposed to the cost that the healthcare provision is happening. I hope that satisfies Rusby. Very helpful. Excellent. Well, I, I, we're kind of a minute over time now. So any final thoughts, Rachel, just before we wrap up and Thanks again to both of you for joining us and sharing your insights. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think just to say, you know, don't ever sort of think technology can't, isn't going to be helpful because it, it really can, but we have to use people and processes and pathways embedded with te technology. It's not one or the other, it's a mixture of, of all of it. Very good. And any final thoughts, Tara? Um, I couldn't agree more if I wanted to. So it's, it is it is the holistic care package and it's complementing traditional medicine. It's not replacing traditional way of doing things. Very good. And one of the things I've taken away from today is looking at people as individuals and providing the, the right solution or the right pathways or the right communication methods for, for every individual because everyone has different circumstances. And that that's, I think, what, what will then drive bigger changes. You know, as we come down to individuals, then we can start to expand and spread upon that. So again, many thanks to, to you both for joining and to Shane and also to, to our audience for joining us both here on um, Teams and on LinkedIn Live. It's been a very good conversation and have a very good rest of your day.